Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, tonight we thank you that we can come into the house of God and just experience your presence, God. Count to your goodness, Lord, uh, that we can feed on your faithfulness tonight, Lord, and on the word of God. Tonight, Lord, as we open your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, tonight we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. Didn't come to hear from Pastor Dan, thank God, because I got nothing to say, Lord. We came to hear from you. Holy Spirit, be welcome in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives. Lord, we'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves any better than anybody else. We see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God, we ask that you bless them. God bless our Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapel, Harvest, Oak Valley. God, for the well and the way. God, for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity. God, we thank you for victory and crossroads, God, uh, for the assemblies and four square denominations. God, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, if they're lifting up your name, preaching your gospel truth, Lord, we bless them. So you would bless us this night. God, also, we just remember our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the nations. Lord, we pray that you protect them, provide for them, and bless them. May they endure to the end, God. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say amen. amen. You can have a seat tonight. Get your Bibles and go with me. Uh, why don't we start in 1 Peter? I might quote another verse before that, but that's okay. We'll have it for you. And uh, you can always turn there in your Bible if you like or, or uh, check it out on the overheads. But tonight I want to talk to you about a subject. Before I do, you guys want to hear a joke? Okay, good, good. I got the right crowd tonight. Now listen, I didn't write this joke, okay? So no one judge me or think that I'm a woman hater or anything like that when I read this, okay, or, or that I'm a, a pig-headed man, but I thought it was appropriate, especially with Father's Day coming up, uh, just, you know, give us some insight into the psyche of some men that are out there that we're all going to judge and look down upon, okay? So, so all right, anyways, don't, don't send me any emails, Pastor Dan, how could you tell that joke? Okay, it's a joke, all right? By the way, anyone live streaming from uh, the back mountains of Tennessee, this is not a slam against you, okay? A man from the back mountains of Tennessee found himself one day in a large city. For the first time standing outside of an elevator, he watched in his, as an old woman hobbled on and the doors closed. A few minutes later, the doors opened and a young, attractive woman marched smartly off. The father hollered at his youngest son, Billy, go get your mother. That's the joke in case you missed it. Which leads me to the title of tonight's message, When Things Don't Change. <laughs> that was my wife on the front row, ladies and gentlemen, leaning her head back and saying, oh my goodness. When things don't change. How many of you know in life, sometimes things just don't change? You could be doing everything right. You could be praying you could be in the Word, you could be confessing the Scriptures, you could be tithing, you could be volunteering, you could be serving, you could be loving, you could be caring, you could be generous, uh, you could have the right outlook, the right attitude, you could do everything right, and yet things still don't change. Anybody other than Pastor Dan know what I'm talking about tonight? Okay, you've been there too. It seems like to me, and my wife, uh, she's shaking her head in approval of, on this statement at least, uh, not the joke, but the other stuff. But it seems like it, there's been a series of these things in our life that God has taken us through these processes over and over and over again. Buy a house, 2008 hits, all of a sudden we're underwater. I, I, I have a conviction in my heart, and you know what, don't just dump it. You, you made a commitment, and you still are making the money to afford the house, so you might as well continue to pay. So I continue to pay, even though it's unjust, it's not the, the value of the property. I said, you know what, I'm going to believe God, bless God, I'm confessing the word that God's going to do something, I'm confessing, I'm confessing, I'm believing, I'm praying, I'm searching the scriptures, I'm, I'm working with the bank, the bank isn't working with me, okay, some of you guys have been there. Two years on my face before God, and on the phone with the company, two years, okay, finally something breaks through. Gosh, things didn't change, two years. 
Well, we had thought, you know, we'd be in this house for a little bit of time, you know, equity, this and that. We had our little plan, you know, we'll be in and out, this and that. Uh, We'll just stay in there a little bit over two years, capital gains, this and that. Nine years later, we're finally, you know, being moved out of the place. Stuff's going on. We have a, a rental property. That's kind of our side business, one of our side businesses, uh, you know. And so um, we have this rental property, and it seemed like we had renter after renter, year after year, uh, situation after situation that we were pouring, and I'm not exaggerating right now, thousands if not tens of thousands, if I added it all up, tens of thousands of dollars into this rental property. I'm believing God. I'm confessing. I'm, I'm tithing. Lord, you, you said you'd rebuke the devourer on my behalf. What? is going on in this rental property. It is devouring like Pac-Man on those little pellets. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Things weren't changing. Things weren't changing. What do you do when things don't change? Tonight, I want to take a look at him. Now, this message tonight, I have to kind of set you up for this. This message assumes that you're doing everything right. Okay? Now, the reason why I have to say that is because if you are in sin... You're not doing everything right. And if you want something to change, stop it. Repent. Turn from that sin. Turn to the Lord. Confess. Ask for forgiveness and watch your life change, okay? That's an easy one. Uh, this, this assumes that you're doing the will of God the way of God. You know, if you're saying, I'm tithing, but you're just giving, come on, somebody. You got to do what God calls you to do, not what you think that God's calling you to do your way. You got to do God's will, God's way, in order to get God's results. So I'm assuming in this message that you're doing everything right, okay? Now, if you say, well, how do I know? Search your heart, pray, and search the scriptures, and God will make that evidently clear to you, okay? I love how the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, if you've got any questions about it, just pray and ask God. He'll make it clear to you, too. He'll let you know. God will show you if there is an error in your life. But if he doesn't show you, and you look in the word and you say, okay, you know, I'm just going to continue to do that, that's what this message assumes. See, this is for after you've done everything you know to do and things still don't change. Uh, remember I said I was going to quote a verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all. See, this is one of those messages, having done all. Because what does he say after having done all? To stand, right? Very next verse says, stand therefore. In other words, you've got to put all of your part in and then stand. Until you've done all, you're not going to stand. Until you've got the whole armor on and you've done everything that you know to do and you've got your feet planted firmly, you're not going to be able to stand. So I'm assuming that we've got Our prayers, we've got our scripture, we've got our confession, we've got our attitudes that, you know, there's always stuff that we can adjust. There's always stuff that the Lord's working on in us. Amen. Okay. I know every day the Lord's jamming me up about something and it's like, okay, God, a little correction there. All right, God. Oh, you don't like, okay, let's do this, you know. And so we're always constantly adjusting. Uh, We're we're rearranging our lives. We're reordering our lives. We're reprioritizing back to the things of God, getting in realignment, if you will, with the things of God. So I I understand that. You know, no one's perfect yet. We're, We're waiting for that day that we get to go be with Jesus and get a new body. But see, there are times where you say, you know what, I've done everything, and yet I still am in the same situation. Still am waiting on the promise. Still am believing God for something. What do I do then? What to do when things don't change. A couple of quick, easy things to do when things don't change. Even though you're doing it all right, even though you've got everything in line and in order, you having done all, and now you're standing there waiting, waiting for God, what do you do when things don't change? Here is what you do. First thing is this. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. See, there's a, a propensity in us, you know, I, I guess you could call it this in nature, that it's easy to backslide when things don't change. It's easy to give up on it and say, okay, God, I guess that's not your will. And so it's almost like we get mad and therefore we're going to go break something just to, you know, out of spite or something. I don't know. You know, like a little kid that gets mad and he's going to go slam a door just to let you know he's mad. You know? And and so the very first thing I got to tell you is if things aren't changing, stay faithful, church. Stay standing. Don't give in to the devil. Don't give in to the flesh just because you're disappointed right now. Stay faithful. Stay in there with God because God is staying in there with you. You know, the Bible tells us that he's 
compassionate and kind. I can't tell you how many scriptures I read there. I wish I could read them all to you tonight. How many times I read that the Lord is patient and long-suffering. God is hanging in there with us. You're not alone in that stance. If you've got everything there, if you're standing, you're standing on the rock. His name is Jesus Christ. God's with you. He's holding on to you. And even though it may seem like he's silent or he's distant or he's far away or maybe he'd forgotten about his promise, listen, he's right there with you. So stay faithful. Stay, just stay faithful to God. Had you turn with me to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, there's an interesting couple of scriptures I want to look at with you, okay? Now, Peter is writing, he starts to write to slaves, okay? And he starts to talk to the slaves about how they should live their lives when it comes to their masters. Now, a saved slave, if he had an unsaved master, he probably could have overlooked some stuff. But you'll find examples in the Bible of saved masters that had saved slaves. And yet, the Bible tells them, if that's the condition you were in when you got saved, Stay in that condition. Now, that trips out the American mind because we are, we, we've experienced things in our nation and we're so opposed to slavery and, and we've seen horrific things in recent years, you know, sex trafficking and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, when we read scriptures like this, it's, it's almost shocking to us that God would tell someone to be obedient to a master. And yet, that's the very thing God tells them to do. In other words, you're a slave, you're in a position you don't like, Yet just stay faithful in that position. Let me show it to you in the Word. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 19. He says, even if your masters are harsh, verse number 19, for this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Now that is so opposed to everything that we know as Americans, Right? All you have to do is flip on the news or read a blog or something like that. Somebody did something. Somebody wronged me. Some, I'm going to tell the world. This is an outrage, right? And yet, here in the Bible it says that if you endure that hardship, even if they are wrong, this is commendable. What does that mean? That means that you are going to get a commendation. God is going to speak well of you. If one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. See, things may have needed to change. You may have been waiting on God, waiting on the promise. And during that waiting, you may have been wrongfully used and abused. And yet God says, if you endure that, that's commendable in the sight of God. Why? Because your heart is linked up to the Lord. That God, I'm going to go through this and I'm going to stay faithful through it because of you. Look at the next verse. Very interesting. Verse 20, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? So in other words, if you mess up and then you take a beating and, and you endure it, what, what com- commendation is there? What, what good is that? You know, that, you, you deserve that whipping, right? So, you know, if you're waiting on God and you, you start getting off into sin and all of a sudden you're going into now discipline or you're going into reaping what you have sown, then that's no credit to you. But look at the rest of the verse. But when you do good and suffer, is that what that says in your Bible? See, this is so contrary to the, the, the ways of our society. We think, no, 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 you do good and you get good. No, when you do good and suffer. All throughout the Bible, the Apostle Paul is telling people about eternal life and they beat the snot out of them. Drag them out of the city, start riots, stone them to death. I mean, this guy's shipwrecked, he's snake bit, he does good and he suffers. See, when you do good and you suffer, if you take it, I can't even bring myself to say the word. Can you say it with me? One, two, three, patiently. Oh, we hate that word, don't we? We have a microwave society. 30 seconds or less or your meal is free. Instant downloads, video on demand. I demand my video right now. (laughs) One push of a button and poof, there it is. My goodness, no. If you take it patiently, this is commendable for God. Not bawling, squalling, crying. I don't know why God is doing what I want to do. I'm doing good and I'm suffering, God. Yeah. You know, the road that Jesus walked is marked with suffering. 
There's blood all over it. And if you're going to walk that road, you're going to drop some blood on the way. Come on, somebody. Hello. So you're tough enough. You can take it. Stay faithful, church. That's what this is all about. I think the best example I found was Jacob. You remember Jacob? Turn me to Genesis. I love Jacob. Jacob chapter 31, okay? Jacob, he travels, he's running away, goes to his uncle Laban, okay? Falls in love. He works seven years for the woman that he loves, ends up getting tricked and gets her sister instead. Whew. Works seven more years. Finally, he's with the one that he loves. Then he works another six years. So 20 years this guy's been working. This guy's been waiting. He's been waiting for change, and yet he's still in the same spot getting used and abused. Genesis chapter 31, you there? Okay, he, he finally meets up with his uncle, right? He, he's, he's left in the middle of the night. They took off, and uh, it would have been all right, except that uh, one of Jacob's wives stole the household Images, the graven images, the gods, right? So Laban comes out after him. He's searching for him. Uh, his daughter tricks him, says, I can't get up, you know. Uh, there's a, a female thing going on right now. So he says, okay, see you later. You know, I'm getting out of this tent. And so uh, now Jacob just has had enough. And he, he just breaks out against his uncle, starts yelling at him. I can just picture veins popping out of his neck. He's in his face, okay? And look at what it says, Genesis chapter 31, verse 38 through verse 42. Genesis chapter 31, starting in verse number 38. Jacob says this, these 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I'm not eating the rams of your flock. In other words, I didn't steal anything from you. I took care of you. Verse 39, that which was torn by beasts, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether it was stolen by day or stolen by night. You misused me. You abused me. I could have taken from you, and yet I chose not to. Verse 40, there I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. You know what? If I was working like that for years, I finally would have said, is this woman worth it? Not sleeping at night? Now, now honey, you're worth it. Oh. But look at what he says. Verse 41, thus I have been in your house 20 years. You want to talk about faithfulness. You want to talk about suffering when he was doing good. Here's the man right here. I served you 14 years for your $2 and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. Verse 42, unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. Look at what he says. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. God showed up to Laban in a dream, told him, you're wrong. Don't, don't say anything. God said, don't you say anything to him, good or bad. And Jacob found out about it. He said, that's why God rebuked you last night, because I'm, I'm right. Finally had enough, finally had it out with his uncle. His uncle makes a covenant with him, and they depart in peace. See, God is watching 20 years, 20 years, 20 years. He stayed faithful. He stayed faithful. See, if, if you're still waiting, if you're waiting for things to change, and there are change in church, Stay faithful. God is watching, and God will deal with your life justly. <laughs> Second thing, not only stay faithful, how about this? Stay committed. Stay committed. It's easy to give up on the promises. We get discouraged, and we say, ah, you know, we may not go into sin, but we might just give up. I guess, you know, this healing thing, I guess it's just not for me. I guess maybe God wants to heal everybody else but me, you know? We get this woe is me kind of pity party attitude, looking around for people who feel the same way. Oh, God didn't heal you either. We're, we're the only two people. We should start an act and travel the country and people can look at us, <laughs> charge money. Only people that God walked out on. And we give up. It's easy to get discouraged, easy to say, well, you know, I see that, I believe that. And yet it's just lip service because in our hearts, mm, I don't believe it. It didn't happen to me. Maybe it won't happen for someone else. Why try? Why pray? Why read? Why go out? Why go to church? Why talk to anybody about it? Why even try? And yet, God says, if you're still waiting, stay committed. Stay consistent. See, I love how Pastor Jim used to say this all the time. 
Commitment without consistency is no real commitment at all. You have to stay consistent. Uh, you're there in Genesis. Turn back this time to 2 Peter, okay? You remember where 1 Peter was? Turn to 2 Peter this time. Okay, one book back from where you were. And in 2 Peter, it's talking about scoffers coming in the last days, okay? And I want to use this illustration. Even though it's talking about the last days and the coming of the Lord, I want to show you something that's an example for us in our lives if we're waiting on the promises of God. 2 Peter chapter 3. Right towards the end of your Bible, if you hit Revelation or the maps, turn around and come back. Second Peter chapter 3 says that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their lust, verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Maybe you've had this. You've been believing God, been waiting for breakthrough, told somebody about it, and a year went by. Next year came around, you said, hey, I'm still waiting. Still believe in God. Then another year went by. Then they asked you about it. Hey, remember you told me about this last year? Did, did that ever happen? Did God ever come through? No, I'm still waiting. Year later, still waiting. Year later, they asked you again. And scoffers come and they say, where is the promise? Is this even real? Do you know what you're believing? Do you know that there really is a God? Do you know that there really is a promise? Does God even care about you? And look at what it says. For since the fathers fell asleep, that means since the ancients died. All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, they're saying nothing's changed and nothing's going to change. That's really what they're inferring in that statement. Now drop down into verse number nine. Verse number nine says this, look at this. The Lord is not slack. Some translations say it this way, slow concerning his promise. As some count slackness or slowness. But is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, anybody who thinks that God wants to send people to hell, that verse right there just tells you, no, he doesn't. God's waiting for everybody to have the opportunity to get in. God wants as many people in heaven. God wants to plunder hell. God does not delight in the death of people who are going to hell. That's not a pleasure to God. God wants people in heaven. God loves people. And so he's waiting patiently. And yes, time is going on and things are continuing. And we're going through struggles and trials. And yes, worldwide there's, there's pain and there's anguish. Why is that? Because God is waiting. God is waiting. Just because God is waiting doesn't mean that God's not doing anything. God is empowering his church to go out and preach the gospel message. Now, that applies to the day of the Lord. That applies to salvation. That applies to the plan of the ages for God. But did you know that also, if you take that same thought, that also applies to us in our situations? What promise are you believing God for? Even though things may continue on the way that they were since the time before you started believing God, God is not slow concerning his promise, as some consider slowness. See, God may not be in your time. He may not come in my time. But can I tell you this? God always comes on time. He's always on time. Think about Jesus, born under the law, born of a virgin, in the fullness of time. Right? Right? God who declares the end from the beginning, the one who is over time, right? Otherwise, time would be a greater force than God. God would have to be submitted to it. God will not submit himself to any. God is the alpha. He is the first. He is the omega. He is the last. God is the, the, the beginning and the end. He is the I am. He always was. He always will be. He is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. Therefore, God knows the plan of the ages. God also knows every promise that he has spoken to you and to me. And God knows exactly how, exactly where, and exactly when your destiny and that answer to your prayer and that thing that you're believing for, he knows where it's going to come. He knows when it's going to come. And he's waiting for the fullness of time to unleash that promise. Can I tell you something? There is a day that you're going to wake up and the promise will come. But you've got to wait. You've got to stay faithful. And you've got to stay committed. Stay committed. Stay in their church. Stay after it. 
just like an enlisted soldier. Think about somebody who is enlisted in the army for life. You know what the Apostle Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, look up at it on the overheads with me. He says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See, we signed up for life. God says you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now think about a soldier who's got orders. I want you to go and I want you to take a post up on the top of that hill and wait there until I come. Soldier goes up on the top of the hill and they're posted there years, years, years go by. They're posted. They're doing their job. They're standing watch. They're standing guard. Now after a while they could say, well, you know what? I don't even know where my, my commanding officer is. I don't even know what happened. I don't know where they've gone. Maybe the war's over and no one told me about it. Maybe I should go check. And yet, if they are a good soldier, you know what they're going to do? They're going to sit there on that hill until they hear otherwise. Why? Because that's how they've been trained. And for us, we need to realize that our commanding officer, the captain of our salvation, Jesus, is calling us to endure. He's saying, I want you to stay in there. I want you to stay there when you don't understand. I want you to stay there when you've prayed and you haven't heard yet. I want you to stay there when you believe me and yet your faith is out there and you're out on a limb. You don't know how you're going to make it. I want you to stay there, stay faithful, and stay committed. You're still a soldier in my army. Man, your post. Just like the Red Sox waiting 87 years to break the curse of the great Bambino. Some of you guys remember that? My goodness, those guys were committed. Jeez, while the Yankees won 37 titles while they're waiting, right? You know, that, that could be like us. We could be waiting saying, how come everybody else is winning the World Series? How come everybody else is celebrating? Where's our victory? And yet, I'm here to tell you, 2004 is coming your way someday. You're going to have a time where you're going to win. You're going to have a time where you're going to break through. There's going to be a day where they're waving your flag and they're waving your banner. Why? Because God knows the times and the seasons. He's got your address. He's got your number. He likes you on Facebook. He's, he's following you on Twitter. He knows how to get a hold of you. You say, God's following me on Twitter? Not really. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. I like this one. This is a good one. Stay up. You say, what does that mean? Stay in faith. Stay positive. Put a smile on your face. Stay up. Stay in the spirit. Listen, if we were to say, okay, where is God, right? Let's say we had a map of, of the, the entirety of the universe, right? We had the omniverse. We had the everything verse, right? We had all the dimensions, all that kind of stuff. God, if you look in the Bible, is in the heavens. If we were to say, where is the heavens, right? Which way would we point? Hopefully up, right? Now, if we were to say hell, bad, where, where is that? Down. So I'm telling you to stay up, Right? Why? You need to have your focus. Set your minds on things above where Christ is seated. Colossians, the third chapter says. Set your hearts on things above. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. We need to stay up. We need to keep, you know the electrical switch, right? When it's dark, the light is off. Which way is that? Down. Down, Down is dark, right? But if you want to shine some light in the room, what do you got to do? You got to flip that light switch up. See, we need to keep the face switch up. We need to keep the light on. We need to let people know that there is somebody home and that the man upstairs is doing his thing. He's working on it. And guess what? My faith is on. I'm staying up. I, I'm happy. I'm excited. It, it may be today. And then when it doesn't come today, are you discouraged? Oh, no. Because that just means that God's given me another day because the promise is coming. Because my God is faithful. He will not go back on his promise. God's going to take care of me. Well, you just wait and watch and see. And if it, even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, that means God's got something greater for me in heaven. See, we're staying up. Oh, I love it. I love it. T. Coley said this, sometimes the ship that is longest on its voyage brings home the richest freight. If the promise tarries, wait for it. A promise long waited for is very precious in its fulfillment. I love that first sentence. Sometimes the ship that is longest on its voyage brings home the richest freight. If you've been waiting a long time, oh my goodness, wait a little longer. Just, just, just watch. God is going to bring something great in your lifetime. Psalm chapter 27, turn there with me. Great couple of verses. Psalm chapter number 27.
Last verse for tonight, Psalm chapter 27. Look at what it says. And last two verses in Psalm 27, so if you want to find Psalm 28 and back up two verses, you can do that too. Look at what it says in verse number 13. I love this. I love how it opens up. Psalm chapter 27, verse 13. I would have lost heart. See, there's something going on in this psalmist's life. Something happened in David's life. And he says, I would have lost heart. See, it's very easy for us to drift away from God. Very easy for us to get off the promises. Very easy for us to go down instead of up. But look at what he says, unless. Oh, thank God there's an unless in the Bible, right? I would have lost heart unless I had believed. Unless I had faith and I believed God, I would have lost heart. I would be down instead of up. Unless I had believed. What did he believe? Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord, where? In the land of the living. God is going to take care of me in this life and in the life to come. I don't have to worry about that. I know about that. But guess what? I'm still in a flesh suit right now. I'm still working out my salvation with fear and trembling right now. There's still things going on that I don't understand right now. I know in part and I see in part. But guess what? I believe something. I've got my faith out there on God for something. I, and I believe not just anything. I believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse number 14, take a look at what it says. It says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say. On the Lord. Oh, come on, church. If you've been waiting on God for something, take courage. Strengthen your heart in the things of God. Believe God. If you've gotten off of God, if you've gotten so mad at God that you walked away and you got in sin over it and you slammed the door just to let God know that you're angry, it's time to turn around and come back and say sorry and repent and get back on the promises of God. Take courage. If you've gotten discouraged and you just have said, oh man, my goodness, I don't know if God's really going to do this. I don't know if God's in this. It's time to get back to your post. Stand your guard. Stand your watch. Wait on the Lord. Don't go down, but keep your faith up. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. God is going to do greater things than you could ask or even think. This afternoon, we had a prayer meeting here at the church. We pray every Wednesday. Oh, it's a great time when we come together as a staff and we pray. Our youth pastor, Pastor Richard Villanueva, the greatest youth pastor on the planet, stood right here. And he was, he was sharing a testimony, and he, we, were, we were praying for the seats. Maybe you guys didn't know this. Sometimes we'll just walk and we'll, we'll touch those seats as, as just a symbol that we're touching hearts, touching lives, praying for you. We prayed for you sitting in that seat tonight. We ask that, that God would touch your life. That, ask that you would hear the voice of God. Ask that God would bless you and prosper you. Ask that God would do great and mighty wonderful things in your marriage, and your family, your children. That God would provide jobs for you. That God would look after you and protect you wherever you go. We, we pray that and we touch the seats. But before we did, Pastor Richard gave us an encouragement. And he said, you guys, you know what? I know oftentimes we'll walk out and we'll touch these seats and we'll pray for seats. But today I don't want you to pray for seats just like we always pray for seats. That's good, but today I want you to make it personal. And he says, for 15 years, I prayed for my dad to give his heart to the Lord. He says, five years ago, if you had told me that my dad would be saved and on fire for the Lord, I, I would not have believed you. I would not have believed you. He says, but this afternoon, I sat at lunch with him. And there across the lunch table, he told me, son, the two most important things in my life, my faith, and Jesus Christ, my Lord. For all of us, there's something that we're waiting on God for. Something that's important to you. That you're saying, God, I see the promise. God, I, I, know, I know you want me to have it. I see it here in your word. God, God, I'm believing. I'm waiting, God. I'm waiting. How long are you willing to wait? Can I submit a time period that you should wait for God to come through on his promise? until just simply wait on God because the day that you give up how do you know that it wouldn't have been the next day that God came through see wait on God until strengthen yourself in the Lord takes courage takes faith it's tough it's hard you might get used and abused along the way and wonder what God is doing but stay in there what did we learn today what do we do when things don't change number one stay faithful 
Stay faithful, church. Stay after the things of God. Number two, stay committed. You have been enlisted as a soldier in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have orders to stand in your spot. And finally, what did we learn? Stay up. Keep the faith switch on. Keep the joy in your heart. Keep that hope and that faith alive on the inside. And let's believe God for great things. Did you guys get something from the word tonight? Come on, let's give God a great big praise tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, we've got a couple minutes. I just want to take some time. If you've been waiting and you're discouraged, would you be brave enough to stand and let me pray for you? You've been waiting on God for something and you're discouraged. Would you just stand right now? All right. All right. Been believing God. Maybe you've been waiting for years. Maybe you've been waiting for months and you're just impatient. That's okay. You can stand up. Look at this. It's like half the church is standing up. That doesn't mean there's time to leave. Come on, let's believe God together. Those of you that are seated, just stretch your hands towards those that are standing. Father, here are your people, God. Many in this place discouraged. Many waiting, God, waiting on a promise, Lord. Father, you know each and every one. You know the length of days they've been waiting, God. Lord, even beyond that, God, you know the number of hairs on their head. You know their times and their seasons. You know the secret places in their hearts. You form them in their mother's womb, God. You know, Lord. And because of that, God, we know that, God, you have the answer. You are the answer, Lord. And so, Father, we just commit to you each and every heart that's standing that's discouraged, God, each and every one that's waiting, Lord. God, we choose to stay faithful. Lord, we just repent of any sin. We say sorry for that right now. Go ahead if you need to tell the Lord, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Confess it to the Lord right now. Repent of that sin. God, we're getting on track with you. Lord, we, we stay committed, God. We're not going to get off this. Lord, we're going to stand in our post. And God, we're going to wait on you. Father, we're going to stay up. We're going to just encourage ourselves in you, Lord. Tonight, we receive strength from your Holy Spirit to keep on keeping on, God, to stand strong. After we've done all, Lord, we will stand. We thank you for it, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. Can we just give the Lord one more great big shout of praise tonight? Hallelujah. God is good. Hey, you guys have been great tonight. I want to thank you guys for staying put. You guys are awesome. We've had a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord singing songs. Some of you guys cried tears before the Lord tonight. Some of you guys, you know, really got encouraged with the word. And I, I could tell you were right there with me. It's just great. But let's not stop there tonight. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. Because it would be a tragedy if we did all that and had such a good time in church and then we let you go and you walked out of this place, your heart wasn't right with God, and you died and you went to hell rather than going to heaven. Now we already talked about this. God does not want you to go to hell. God's waiting patiently so that you can go to heaven. He's not some sadistic, mean old man in the sky condemning people to hell. No, that's not his business. He's redeeming us to life and to heaven. That's why he sent Jesus beaten bloody and hung on a cross so that we didn't have to go to hell. So tonight, let me ask you this question. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Because I'm assuming nobody thinks, oh, I'm just headed for hell, or no one's excited, no one's foolish to say, oh, I want to go to hell, it's going to be a big party. Come on, let's get real. So what makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm going to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. God's loving and good, and he just wants us all to make it there, so he, he made it that way. All roads lead to heaven. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. The church is out there and their world religion, they do whatever they want to do. Well, I'll make it to whatever they call it, you know, and, and it'll be all good. We'll all see each other there and it'll be, it'll be a neat eternity together. Problem with that thinking, is you know that nowhere in the Bible to say that all roads lead to heaven? It doesn't work like that. You think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten bloody mess, hung on the cross, public spectacle for all to see that after all that planning all that time all of the prophecies the intricate details of how he was going to carry out our redemption do you think after he does all that that he says yeah whatever you want to do and whatever they want to do and just everybody can do their own thing and just I'll see you there just stay true to yourself or something like that you think God's just kind of loosey-goosey like that no God tells us exactly how to get to heaven right here in his word and to say all roads lead to heaven is like saying all roads lead to the moon. Listen, you can drive around the earth as long as you want and you will never make it. Not going to get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. 
Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, that's good news to me because I know God's ways by being good. I've been a really good person. Yeah, I used to be bad. I cleaned up my act. Now I've been really good lately. In fact, I think finally I'm on the other side. My, my good outweighs my bad. And, you know, I've been working on my resume for heaven. I'll, I'll let God know all the good stuff I've done. I've helped people out, uh, given money to charities, been involved in social justice cause, been nice to my neighbors, called my dad on Father's Day last year and planning on doing it again this year. I've been a really good person, pastor. I think that God's going to let me into heaven because I've been good. But again, the problem with that thing is, do you know that nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get to heaven. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says our goodness compared to God's goodness, like filthy racks, going to get thrown out. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us is perfect. And so we're not going to make it there based on our own goodness. Got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I, okay, I understand that. But, you know, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. You went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class. Maybe Sabbath school class. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. They we're Christians, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible say that your parents raised you in church tell you Christian that makes you a Christian? You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or attend religious classes, or be born in America, that you get to go to heaven because America is the Christian nation. It's not there. And again, nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Listen, if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, let me love you enough and respect you enough, honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church right now. I'm, I'm right here in front of you. Can't you see me? I, I consider myself to be a Christian because I'm here in church. It's great. I'm glad that you're here. But you know that nowhere in the Bible say that because you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You know, I talked about the Red Sox tonight. Let's use them. What if I said, I want to be a Red Sox? You know, what, what if I want to do that? And so I get on a uniform, uh, go down to their stadium, bring my bat and my ball, sit in the dugout call myself one of the Red Sox and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I am not a member of the Red Sox organization. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but, oh, okay, I get that, Pastor, but you don't understand. My last church, I got involved, helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible where your church attendance and church involvement and volunteer hours get you into heaven. It doesn't work. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can do church work, get involved, sing in the choir, teach in the Bible class, any of that kind of stuff, and you get to go to heaven. God's not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. You say, but pastor, hold on. I know God. I mean, someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life? I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, let me ask you this question. If you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. Are they Christians because they know who Jesus is? Is the devil a Christian because he knows who Jesus is and can quote some scripture? You'll find that in your Bible too. You know that? Devil quoting scriptures. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. Everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. Not about having some mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is. And that makes you a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. Here's the real question tonight. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Because if not, I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. And Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals called it some weirdo stuff and made it out to be something that it's not. Something that we don't want to have any part of and I, I understand why. But listen, let's not let Hollywood movies, television, books, and the internet define for us what being born again means. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. 
Now, those are pretty gross and graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out. A little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second, time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be embarrassed. Let's get over that tonight. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Listen, you tell that devil, go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God tonight. You get your hand up. Even if you're embarrassed, it's better than ending up in hell. Now listen, no one's criticizing. No one's judging. No one's condemning you. We're all excited about your choice tonight. We've all done it at one point or another in our lives as well, and we're waiting on you, believing God for you, praying for you. Now, will you give God all of your heart and all of your life in this safe and friendly church service? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight is your night. Come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it? Get ready to get your hand up. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. And then tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. If you're online, wherever you're at, God sees, God's watching wherever you're at all over the world. You can raise your hand right there and then you can minimize your video screen and there's a blue button that says respond to God or go to our homepage, rockchurch.com and go to the button that says how to know God and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm gonna count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up if you need to do this. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one. There's two. There's three. Thank you. There's four, five, six, seven, eight. God bless you guys. Eight, nine, ten. Thank you over there. Eleven. Gotcha. Twelve. Right there. Thank you. Twelve wise people already on this side. On this side. Come on. Don't tell me everybody need to get saved and sat on this side tonight. Where you at? Oh, two hands. All right. 12, 13. Got you right there. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? 13 wise people. Anybody else? 14. Got you up there. 15. Got you right there. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's 15 wise people in this place. Anybody else real quick? Know that the Lord's tugging on your heart tonight. If that's you and you can sense that and you say, ah, man, something's just on me right now and I feel like, yeah, you need to do this. Go for it. Come on. Just raise it up high. You know, God just spoke to you right now. If that's you, anybody else real quick? We've got 15 wise people already. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm going to close it up in a second. Don't miss this opportunity. If that's you. Anybody else? One last sweep, and then I'm going to wrap this thing up. There's 15 wise people. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. We got good. All right, all 15 of you are your number 16. You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Why don't you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. You come right now. Come on down. Won't you come just as you are? Come on, they're coming. You can come too. Oh, and hear the family rooms if you need to bring your children come on down they'll remember this just as you Else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. 
She'll come in. Come on, you can come too. We'll wait for you. Come on down right now. All right, hallelujah. They're still coming. Come on, come on. You can come too. Let's encourage them. That's you. You need to come. Plenty of room. We're waiting for you. Come on down. All right, hey everybody up front, look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing, this is not a bad thing. You came to give God all of your heart, came to give God all of your life. Right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? This is Reverend Antonio, okay? We call him Tony, he's a good guy. Nothing weird's gonna go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, I'm about as weird as it gets with the jokes tonight, okay? That's, that's it, all right? He's, he's stable, he's cool, he's friendly, all right? So you already got past me. This is easy, okay? He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance so you're not wondering or concerned, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. Then he's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Take home, read about what just happened in your life. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next? And then thirdly, he's going to talk to you about a program we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. We call them SPTs, all right? Basically, it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. Now listen, listen, listen. Listen, I want to ask you guys for something. I ask you guys to stay with us, stay faithful, stay consistent, stay up. Give us one year here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. One year of your life, sitting consistently under the teaching of God, okay? After that year and for the rest of your life, I promise you will look around and you'll say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize I could be so blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. Okay, take their word for it, all right? You guys make a left turn, follow Reverend Antonio right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.